Courageous World Literature. This is Lesson 34 and the last tape of the year. Congratulations. We're going to finish up our discussion on Les Miserables today, and then at the end we'll have a few comments on what to expect for the final exam. Remember that you pick this final exam up next Tuesday, which is the, um, the 19th, of May at Hoffmantown, and you will have to return it completed the following Tuesday, which is um, the 26th. Now, remember that these dates are firm. There are no exceptions. There are no shifts. So if you're not able to make it and you don't make arrangements to have it picked up, uh, then you will have an incomplete on your report card. So please make no mistakes about that. We, we must wrap up this school year and get you on so that you uh, can can have some summer and have that sense that you've absolutely completed. We do not want this school year, which has already been so challenging for you, to linger on through the summer. You will have very low chance of success if you approach it that way. So we're just making it easy for you by letting you know you have no choice. Now, before we begin, I'd like to focus our last scripture there. I trust that you have gotten to the end of the novel now. This is an absolutely beautiful novel with some amazing themes in it. And we have been focusing on the personal journey of Jean Valjean, which I do believe is the largest focus of the book. It goes from the very beginning of the book with that little bit of prelude about the man who starts him on his journey and goes all the way to the last page. Now, the revolution aspect of this book and um, the event at the barricades and all those young revolutionists who give their lives is a focus of the book, but it is not the key focus of the book. And I hope that you, as you've read the book, understand that that is a, a significant but sub-story to the whole um to the whole book, okay? And you always want to, as you're analyzing a story, you want to look at the whole entirety of that book. Well, we are going to um, begin with this passage. It is one more passage about his journey. It's a beautiful scripture, and it says, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, meaning in my own body as I'm living still this side of death, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I think that this is a very appropriate passage to look at because it is really talking about that journey of the Christian life. It is a journey into death, death to self, death to, death to our own pleasures, death to our own happiness, death to our own goals. And then a journey into godliness as we learn to not take on our own way. We continue to lay our own way aside, and we say, what is the way of Christ? And that's what we see Jean Valjean doing, and he has done this many times already in the book. And one way you can identify all those ways is by just considering his sleepless nights. How many times has he turned his mind over and over and over again, trying to find the course to take, not because his soul didn't know the course to take, but, but because the price tag seemed too high. And that's what we see. That is the journey of the Christian life. Lots of quandary between my way and Christ's way, each leading to a quote-unquote Garden of Gethsemane experience where I die to say and come to the point where as Christ, I say, not my will, but yours be done. And then we live 
a lot of life. We have little bumps in the road. We have joys in the road. We have happiness. We have pain like all of like all of life is full of. And then we get to another crisis. And what is the crisis? The primary crisis is an internal one. I don't want to do what's right in this situation. It's too big for me. The cost is too high. I withdraw. I think my the me in me screams out. No, I don't want this. And we tr- and we wrestle. And we wrestle as it were with the angel. And at the end what happens? The Holy Spirit who is always in this job of drawing us into himself and of changing us into the image of the Son so that we reflect Christ more and more in our lives. He always brings resolution in our hearts. Now, I'm not saying that we always make the right choice in the sense that there's sometimes we don't, okay? But God will bring us back around for another chance, so to speak. We'll have other opportunities. But the whole process is one of dying to self and living to godliness. And that's what we speak of in this scripture. So that is what it means to grow in grace and godliness. Laying down my will, no matter what the cost, and embracing Christ. And of course, it's something we need his absolute help and power to do. But we do have to make real choices along the way. And so know that that's, uh, that really is the essence of what it means to walk with him. Okay, And so ask the Lord for the grace that you may say with Paul, and that in a way you may say with Valjean, that you may say with um, the bishop, Bienvenue at the beginning of the book, that your voice may echo the voices down through the ages. Not my will, Lord Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. Well, I love teaching this book because it is such a powerful example to us, and I want to talk about just a few last sections. Number one would be the section at the barricades. And although there are many, many people sacrificing at the barricades, in this last section, I am not going to go over the whole plot, but we are going to put a certain pair of eyes on it, and we're going to focus on the journey of of Jean Valjean. So the first, excuse me, so the first sacrifice that we see from him is where, remember, he comes into the barricade and he's able to pass through the street and therefore the implication is he will be able to escape again through the streets because he has his old National Guard uniform. And um, I'm not sure where he got that National Guard uniform, to be honest. Uh, (laughs) That might be a detail that the story gives me, but I don't remember it at the moment. But he has this old uniform, and because of that, he's able to pass freely in the street. Well, almost as soon as he gets into the barricade, they are trying to decide to give four people older people, people that have others depending upon them. They know this is a suicide mission at the barricades in their revolutionary stand. Similar to the Alamo, we might think of every man will die before the next day is out. The odds are way too great. There is no way they will survive this. And so the idea is that four should be allowed to go free because they have four uniforms pulled off men that have already been killed. And so this is at night after the battle or the skirmish is over for the night and they're getting ready to renew it again in the morning. And Jean Valjean drops another uniform on the pile. Now this is a sacrifice more than, I mean, it's not talked about too much as to why, but we recognize that it is because that is his way of escape again, and he's given it up. So there will be, he's planning that he will not leave. He also will die before the night is over. Of course, it doesn't work out that way, but that is the full expectation. 
The second thing we see is his ongoing sacrifice and bravery during the battle. Now, what we want to point out is he's never fighting to kill a person. Remember, he's always working behind the scenes. He's tending to the wounded. He's carrying them away from the um, line of fire. He, sh he goes out and exposes himself to shoot down the mattress so that they can survive the, the night of the uh, cannons. Okay. And so in all these things, he is being sacrificial, but never in a way that would allow somebody else to be injured. In other words, not even the opponent, not even the, um, the soldiers outside that are attacking. He is not shooting, but he is doing everything else in heroism, sacrificing, exposing, putting himself in harm's way. Another thing we recognize is why did he come to the barricades? He came to rescue Marius, even though he, Marius represents a great threat to him. He does not like Marius, not one bit. Marius is the one who will take away the love of his life, Cassette, right? his daughter. He doesn't want to lose her to somebody else. And so this greatest threat, perhaps, of his entire life, uh, maybe even greater than the Chat Matthew affair, he does not want, even worse than going to prison, is the idea that Cassette would be um, taken from him, not just physically, but emotionally. That she, that she would not care for him as she once had. And this is, in a way, his greatest insecurity. And when God is working in our lives and taking, on, taking us on this long journey, part of what he's doing in us is building godliness. Remember how we talked about from glory to glory? He's changing us. Well, what, how does he build godliness in us? He takes those things that are misaligned with his character. So, And this is one that is misaligned in um, Valjean. He, he cannot believe that he is really worthy of love that somebody would really care for him, that even his daughter, whom he has taken care of so many, so much for the last nine years, that even she would continue to care from her, for him when somebody else has come into her life. So this is exposing something very weak in Valjean's character that is yet to be worked on, quote-unquote. And that's what is happening in this part of the story. Now, so even though he... Um, has this hatred for Marius. What we're looking at is sacrifice at the barricades. He has come to the barricades for the sole purpose of rescuing Marius. And finally, the greatest perhaps sacrifice of this part is when he says that he will take the spy, Javert, out in order to kill him, to execute him right before the last big skirmish where they all expect to die. And remember, they've waited till the very end because they did not want to give up not even a single extra bullet. The bullets have been so precious to them. So he takes him out, and rather than shooting him, he only pretends that he has shot him, and he says, go. Now, why is that such a great sacrifice? Because, of course, this is his arch nemesis. This is the man who has made it basically a, a significant part of his life mission to catch this great criminal in his mind, this great obstructor of justice. And so, and then he even says, This is who I am, and this is where I live, and I will expect you to come get me. So there's a great yielding as he rescues. Javert. Now, one thing I want you to notice is that in all these things, he is doing what is right, not what he wants, not what is best for him. But the question that underlines all this behavior is what is the right thing to do? What is the pure thing? What is the noble thing? So let's go now to the next section where he rescues Marius. 
Now, this is the journey through the sewers and through the mire. At one point, the actual uh, cement or stone floor has, has washed out beneath them, and it's only full of this deep, deep mire or mud that is sinking in the midst of all this wetness. It's sinking. He's totally in the dark. He's going up, and this water is going uh, above into his calves, above his calves, and then um, in, above his thighs, around his waist, all the way till it gets so far. This is a combination of mud halfway up and then water the rest of the way till it is actually up to his mouth. And he's having to hold his head back, carrying this essentially a corpse, totally dead waist. He, uh, I'm sorry, totally dead uh, weight as as Marius is, is fainted, he's unconscious, he's very deeply wounded, he's losing a lot of blood, he only knows that he has the faintest pulse left. And his own life is in danger. Had he not had this much weight that he's bearing down on his body, now we remember that um, Valjean is a strong man, but nonetheless this is taxing every last ounce of his energy. And he wants to heave and throw that body forward. The chances of this person that he's carrying out, Marius, is um, of living is very, very slim if he isn't dead already. And all he has to do is let that body die and his body, his body will be lighter in the mud. It won't be so pressed down into the mire and he most likely will be able to get out alive. But with this heroic effort, physical, physically a heroic effort, he is sacrificing himself to try to rescue Marius, even though there's no certainty at all that he would even live through this ordeal. As he has come almost to the very complete edge of his strength, he comes to the grating and there is no way he can move that grate. Um, even putting the body down, it's, it's locked, it's double locked, and he has no strength to actually unhinge it. And then a voice comes out of the darkness, and Thenardier is there at the gate. And Thenardier sells him, right, trades him, all the money he gained off the dead body. He assesses the situation and decides that this man, he does not recognize Valjean, but he uh, decides that he has just assassinated a man for money and has come to escape down through the sewers. But he needs the key, and Thenardier has the key. And so they make this transition. Also, Thenardier is trying to escape from Javert himself, so he also needs a, a body, so to speak, a bone to throw to the dog so that he, he gets Javert off his track. So Thenardier is the next man he confronts, and he is... Um, bargaining with him, which must be definitely oppressive to him. And he uh, trades with Thenardier to get the way through the gate. And almost immediately then he is confronted by Javert. And he makes a bargain with him. He says, uh, please let me go. Let's take this dying man to his grandfather's and then you can do with me what you will. I consider myself in your hands. So this, when we speak about things we're dying to, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This is one of those. He says, just let me do this, and then I am your man. I yield myself to you. As actually, after they drop Marius off at his grandfather's, he says it one more time. He says, just let me do one more thing. And what is that? When he goes back to his own house and he arranges the money, the money. And he expects that as soon as he goes downstairs, okay, um, that Javert will take him away to prison and then back to the galleys for the rest of his life. So he has already, this has been a great concession of will. What for the sake of Marius. He would have been able to escape if his concern was not more for Marius than himself. 
And yet Javert, surprise of one of the great surprises of the story, is when he is upstairs in the garret, Javert leaves. Well, why does Javert leave? Now that's the part I'm not tracing down for you. You think about that. Why does Javert leave? The book goes into it, explains it at length, okay, and you will want to know that. Why does he let Valjean go free? And what are the consequences of that for his own life? Well, let's look at two quotes here. And we want to look on 712 in your book, which, of course, is the Barnes & Noble version. Second to the last paragraph at the bottom of the page, he says, The pupil dilates in the night and at last finds day in it as he gets himself accustomed to the sewers and being able to see just a little bit, just enough. And then it says, I love this phrase, even as the soul dilates in misfortune and at last finds God in it. What a beautiful comparison. This is a simile that the author is making really totally apart from the plot of the story. He's saying, okay, finally his eyes got adjusted to the light. That in and of itself is not profound. But then he adds to that, just as misfortune adjusts our eyes to the light so that we can see God. Isn't that interesting? Misfortune. Now, what are we talking about? What's the overall idea in this section? Choosing pain, misfortune, trial, trouble, as opposed to self-preservation. Misfortune, what? At reveals God. Isn't that interesting? So I want you to reflect on that just a little bit more on your own. And then the next quote is on 7 19. Now, we have talked quite a bit about the external sacrifice that's going on in this time, the, the physical strength, the, the danger of being rearrested, all these things. But now let's look at something else on the bottom of four nine, or 719. And it says, Jean Valjean, removing the garments with the ends of his fingers, laid his hand upon his breast speaking of Valjean's hand upon the breast of Marius. The heart still beat. Jean Valjean tore up his shirt, bandaged the wounds as well as he could, and staunched the flowing blood. Then, bending in the twilight over Marius, who was still unconscious and almost lifeless, he looked at him with an inexpressible hatred. This is the man for whom he is sacrificing himself. Right? It says, peradventure, one might very occasionally, it says in the scripture, sacrifice himself for a good man. But God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we are in a posture. Now, it's interesting because, I mean, that doesn't quite fit one-on-one -on -one with this, but it is interesting to me that this is not for a best friend that Valjean is sacrificing himself. It is not for Bienvenu, somebody he respects perhaps more than anybody else he's ever known, that he sacrifices himself. He is sacrificing himself for his enemy. Why is he his enemy? We've already talked about that because of Cosette. So why is he choosing to save him? We haven't talked about that. Why does Valjean decide to save Marius? Well, it, he hates him, right? and yet he'll save him, risking himself greatly. Why? Because he loves Cosette, and Cosette loves Marius. Well, let that ponder over your heart a little. So again, the motive in all of this section, do what is right. Not what you want. Not what serves your purposes. Not what is self-interested. Not what is self-preserving. 
but do what is right. Now, the third section has to do with the confession he makes to Marius. Now, you know that Marius comes back. He recovers. All, a lot of things have been revealed, and he has been taken off the battlefield. As, um, not the battlefield, but the barricade, the battle line. And he has recovered. It's taking, in all, it takes about six months for him to recover. So his wounds are serious. And in that, Cassette comes back into his life and uh, they they get ready for their marriage, and they they reconcile with the uh, his grandfather, and all these good things are happening. And then, right at the time of the marriage, Valjean confesses, makes a confession to Marius about who he is, about his past. Now we note that it is not a full confession. Now, what he does, now remember, by the way, that, that Valjean is used to le leading all along for decades and decades. He's about 50 now, a very private and quiet and secretive life. And so he doesn't confess everything about his life for several reasons. Probably one is that, and two probably is that he doesn't want them to come under any danger, and three probably is that he doesn't want to take it, he's, he's modest, and he doesn't want to take any credit for the noble things he does do. So all of these conflicting ideas are in his heart, and, but he does confect, uh, confess the essential thing, and that is that he is a convict. And he puts himself, he submits to whatever Marius's laws or rules of the house or whatever might be on how much or how little he should be involved in Cassette's life. Though he does say wistfully at the end, of course, I would love to be able to see her as little or as much as you require, whether up in the grand rooms of the family or even just in a little hovel or a little basement, damp basement, which is, of course, you know where he ends up visiting with Cassette. Now, so he submits to Marius's commands, respecting him, letting him take first place as her husband. But we also have to ask, ask ourselves, in fact, Marius asks, why? What are your motives for this? If this is some long time ago crime and you've repaired it with a great life, um, why would you why would you confess these things? Well, the police are off his tail, right? Uh, they they don't represent a threat anymore. Javert, in fact, has already committed suicide. All the other policemen believe that he is dead, that he died in the water from uh, as he fell into off the ship, if you call, from way back before. Um, so what would be the motive? And you want to think that through a little bit yourself, okay? So he submits, and we want to talk about his motives. Now, he also arranges the inheritance. Well, I don't know if inheritance is the right word. The dowry, so to speak, money of for Cassette, 600,000 francs. And he also um, arranges that she would have a new name that, that everybody understands or, or that... Marius understands that he is not, Valjean is not Cassette's father, that he is just a poor gardener, but the other gardener, and this is again one of those little lies he tells to protect her, was truly the gardener who had died, Fashelevant, was truly, the old Fashelevant, was her father, and and he arranges even a false birth certificate, naming her Euphrasie Fashelevant. Now, you go ahead and do the thinking on what you think motivates. Even look back in the book, uh, because you will be asked that on your test. But what do you think motivates 
Jean Valjean to make take this action. Now there is part of the hint. This is not the practical motivation. There is a practical motivation too that I want you to consider. But I'd also like to read some key quotes here beginning with page 769. And here it says at the beginning of the new section the formidable old struggle <laughs> think about this in regard now to our scripture. The formidable old struggle several phases of which we have already seen, recommenced. Jacob wrestled with the angel but one night. Alas, how many times have we seen Jean Valjean clenched body to body in the darkness with his conscience and, rest, and wrestling desperately against it. He had reached the last crossing of good and evil. He had that dark intersection before his eyes. This time again, as it had already happened to him in other sorrowful crises, two roads opened before him, the one tempting, the other terrible. Which should he take? We go on in the next page, and towards the top, it says, we have never done with conscience. In other words, we're never done wrestling with our conscience. Choose your course by it. Then it goes at the end of the paragraph. Let's see. We cast into this pit the labor of our whole life. We cast in our fortune. We cast in our riches. We cast in our success. We cast in our liberty or our country. We cast in our well-being. We cast in our peace of mind. We cast in our happiness. More, more, more. Empty the vase. Turn out the urn. We must at last cast in our heart. And this is that really that dying to self, each challenge becoming more difficult than the time before. At the very end, it says, to see him thus without motion, one would have said he was dead. Suddenly he thrilled convulsively and his mouth fixed upon Cassette's garments, kissed them. Then one song that he was alive. He goes on, what one? In other words, who saw? Who saw that he was alive? Since Jean Valjean was alone and there was nobody there. The one who is in the darkness. Who's that one in the darkness? God, right? God Almighty. And what's the point here? Is God sees. God sees our sacrifice. He sees every time we lay ourselves aside and choose, us and choose his way. Let's look at the very bottom then of page 778. He says, you ask why I speak? I am neither informed against nor pursued nor hunted, say you? Yes, I am informed against. Yes, I am pursued. Yes, I am hunted. By whom? By myself. It is I who bar the way before myself, and I drag myself, and I urge myself, and I check myself, and I exert myself. And when one holds himself, he is well held. He goes on, on the next page. Look at this hand now. Don't you think that it holds this collar in such a way as not to let go? Well, conscience has quite another grasp. If we wish to be happy, monsieur, we must never comprehend duty. For as soon as we comprehend it, it is implacable. One would say that it punishes you for comprehending it, but no, it rewards you for it. For it puts you into a hell where you feel God at your side. Your heart is not so soon lacerated when you are at peace with him. Beautiful, beautiful ideas that I would suggest that you reflect on. The idea that conscience holds us tight. Now the last thing that you need to focus on in this is how the book resolves. Okay. We see that... 
that Valjean becomes weaker and weaker, and yet there is a strength emerging, physically weaker and weaker. And yet his conscience, what's he say even in that beautiful quote we just left? Okay. He's, he talks about the idea that God is at our side. right? And yet we don't want to think that in that strength that life becomes any easier. It doesn't. In fact, this is the lifelong struggle. And there is great suffering in it. There is great suffering in dying to ourselves. Okay. Think of the Garden of Gethsemane and the journey of Christ. And the book refers to it. It refers past, uh, to that and the suffering of Christ here at the end more stronger. It has actually made many references to it all along to the suffering of Christ. Okay, But though we become stronger, there is also suffering here. Let me write this down. Words that come to my mind, not just the Garden of Gethsemane, but also when we think of John the Baptist, and he says, he must, what, increase, and I must decrease. And the last thing that you don't want to miss is how much God's grace is with him. He becomes quieter and quieter, spirit and soul, and more and more yielded at the very end. So this is God's grace that enables us to take this journey. And we all take it. There's only two ways to live, for yourself or for God and others. Let's look at um, 805. And it says, the very first sentences of this section, it says, it is a fearsome thing to be happy. How pleased we are with it. How all-sufficient we think it. And we're thinking of Cassette now and Marius, their happiness in one another, as especially Cassette. And she's not trying to be hurtful to her, uh, to Valjean, her, her father, but she is being neglectful because of her happiness. And then it says, How, being in possession of the false aim of life, happiness, we forget the true aim, duty. The true aim of life, of this life here, is not happiness, but duty. And this is what we see, actually, Valjean embracing in ever-increasing steps. If we then look over at 823 for our next quote, I'm going to read this whole last paragraph. He says, Cassette, do you hear? That is the way with him. Speaking, Marius is saying this about Jean Valjean in Jean Valjean's presence. He begs my pardon. And do you know what he has done for me, Cassette? He has saved my life. He has done more. He has given you to me. And after having saved me, and after having given you to me, Cassette, what did he do with himself? He sacrificed himself. There is the man, and to me the ungrateful, to me the forgetful, to me the pitiless, to me the guilty. He says thanks. He says thanks. Cassette, my whole life passed at the feet of this man would be too little. That barricade, that sewer, that furnace, that cloaca, that he went through everything for me, for you, Cassette. He bore me through death in every form which he put aside from me and which he accepted for himself. All courage, all virtue, all heroism, all sanctity. He was, he has it all, Cassette. That man is an angel. That's a beautiful description as Marius's eyes are open and he recognized who Valjean has truly been to him. But I want you to pause, put the tape on pause, and read that whole paragraph again and think of Christ. This is also a beautiful description of who Christ is for us, for you and for me. And a whole life long lived at his feet would not be enough. 
as much as he deserves. Now, we call this in literature when the allusion is so strongly to Christ in an individual as his character is changing and developing. We call this a Christ figure. Jean Valjean is a Christ figure in literature because as he grows in grace, he's an unlikely one in one sense because he is no great saint from beginning to end, okay? He is a sinner growing into grace, growing into a saint, so to speak, okay? But he more and more takes on Christ so that at the end here, he is what? Who do we see? Go back to Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in, son of, in the Son of God. Right? So who is he seeing? He is seeing and giving praise, Marius is, to Valjean, but we see standing right behind. Just like remember through so much of the story, uh, Bienvenu is standing right behind when Valjean is being challenged. He looks, he looks, and in his heart he remembers Bienvenu. Well, now as Marius he looks, Marius looks. Who do we see? Right behind Jean Valjean, we see the Savior. And that really is the bottom line. It's not about looking at one another. It's by looking at the ultimate, amazing one, an angel more than an angel, a savior. Last quote of the book that I'm going to focus on is on 826, and this brings the same point home. He did About three, four-fifths of the way down the page, he says, he takes the crucifix. He has a momentary of strength. He's dying. These are his last moments of being alive. But he has a momentary strength, and he goes up, and he walks over to the wall. He takes down the crucifix, and he lays it on the table beside them. And he says, behold the great martyr. So everything that I've done, he's saying at the very end of his life, is nothing compared to him. Well, I am going to go to a part two that is going to spend about 10 minutes, no more, telling you what to expect on your final exam. Now on 826, Jean Valjean, he's got a last burst of strength. He is dying. He's going to be dead in a few minutes here. But he goes over to the wall. He takes the crucifix down off the wall. I might be repeating myself. I'm a little unclear on what happened to the tape. So bear with me if I am. And he lays it down on the table and he says, Behold the great martyr. Again, he must increase, right? So everything that Jean Valjean has done in this whole book is nothing in comparison with Christ. The true one. The great one, the great, the one we emulate and live to try to choose his way, to try to do what is right. And yet all our lifetime, we're just growing uh, really dimly towards that light. But someday we will be like him. Beautiful, beautiful book. So I hope that inspires you. I'm going to stop now. And on the next tape, I will give you about a 10 to 15 minute uh, summary about some of the things you can expect on the final exam.